mode. Good morning, everyone. Today is uh, Friday, the 21st of June, and we're celebrating the Cancer Solstice. I don't call it the, I'm not calling it the uh, spring solstice or the or summer solstice or the winter solstice because it is reversed in the southern hemisphere and you know we have a lot of attendees that are coming from there so that is uh it's in your chat box and i probably have sent it to you or michael has uh the 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 solstice itself uh is this afternoon in europe that is a universal time greenwich mean time at 3 54 and 8 uh, seconds and now Actually, Tuya and uh, I begin uh, the presentation, the broadcast. Actually, it's Tuya. I'm, I'm the engineer, but, you know, so you, we're all in trouble. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, um, that, that begins at 2.35, 2.35 uh, London time, not London time, GMT, Universal Time. And uh, around 3.45, uh, we're going to be uh, joining the international group that, an aspect of the international group that is preparing for the festival week of the new group of world servers. So we're connecting uh, particularly with uh, uh, Alexander Ilchuk and the, um, the 2025 initiative and other people. So we'll, we'll try to do our... Uh, sort of 12 minutes of silent meditation with each other and then uh, saying the great invocation in some different languages. And then we'll go back to our broadcast. It's an experiment and uh, it seemed to work okay yesterday in the uh, rehearsal. But, you know, we're trying to mix modes here of the broadcast mode and the webinar mode. And uh, so so we'll just do our best. So anyway, at... Uh, at 2.35, and a little bit before that for music, at 2.35, we uh, begin the broadcast um, for the solstice the way we usually do it. And then about an hour later, uh, a little more, we'll be joining the group that is preparing for the uh, larger events. We have to prepare the whole year, really. I think it's the wisest thing to do. Um, every seven years, the opportunity strikes for the new group of world servers to make uh, uh, a step forward. And uh, we're really in need of that at this time because there is, uh, I don't know, so much uh, friction and lack of consideration of others and uh, nations not considering each other and selfish forces moving. So we hope that our work with the new group of world servers will uh, facilitate uh, a better attitude in 2020. You know, 2020 suggests a perfect vision. Hopefully we have increased our, uh, the accuracy of our vision among many human beings. Just want to uh, welcome you here. You know, there's a, it's, it, it's very much in the middle of the night in the United States and, uh, in South America, I appreciate that uh, Michael Stacy is here in the wee hours backing us up on the technical side. So just want to say good morning, uh, at least from here, to uh, Alexandra, and marie Annette, uh, Barbara. Some, some are up in the middle of the night, I can see that. Catherine, Gretchen, Karen, uh, Kim, Margot, Martha, Sam, uh, Stacia, uh, Stephen, Suzanne, Tia, T.U., and uh, two years on both sides here. Okay, and Zanidi. And good morning, everyone. And let's, uh, we'll continue with our reading, which I think uh, is very interesting because there's something about the, that, that um, composite glamour that we call the dweller on the threshold which eventually turns out to be the entire um, polished and uh, uh, well-developed personality as it can 
either oppose the uh, direction of the soul or become kind of a subray and a true instrument of the soul. So let's just uh, for a moment uh, link with each other. And wherever we may be geographically, we feel that that uh, normal way of measuring space is overcome and we are uh, together at a certain point of tension, which means that we are developing a field of consciousness together. And upon that field of consciousness may the higher impressions <clears throat> strike so that in our studies we gain more uh, wisdom and love and intelligence and uh, willingness to uh, sacrifice for the sake of the divine plan and do really what is required. And we're welcoming more people as we go along, but you know, I only read it once, so welcome everybody that just came on. Okay. Now, where are we? Somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, okay. So this is our work beginning this is the 55th reading on the 115th program. You know, uh, it would be our intention to, and I think, you know, you could enjoy this and it would be a benefit to you to begin reading through certain of the books in this way, you know, sort of uh, together. We do that with the faculty. Um, and it takes a while. And um, in, in a way, we're doing that already in, as part of the Ask program because uh, uh, Tudia is reading from the reappearance of the Christ, both in English and uh, Finnish. You know, we are a bridging country here between the, um, between the preparatory school of Sweden and the advanced school of Russia. So we have our place as a bridge helping to uh, increase the appreciation of esotericism, which must be increased by and win the day by the end of this uh, century. So we do the reappearance of the Christ on uh, on those mornings when we do the uh, uh, that particular meditation for the Ask program. Ask is invocation, as you know. Um, and we're also working uh, in the Destiny of the Nations, wonderful book. Um, and we're, you know, being systematic over the months and years in the reading there. And uh, it's also possible to do uh, some other books along this line. Uh, our task right now is a major assimilation task. We know that uh, Master DK has told us that around the year 2025, the, sir, uh, the third series of bridging treatises will be uh, begun and presented to humanity. We don't know uh, for how long. Will it be another 30 years work or how long will it take? But it will be presented. And so our work now to work intensively on the inside for the preservation of hierarchical values in society, culture, and civilization, and also simply for the absorption of what he has already given, which is immense. As he says, I know it's more than you can ever absorb, but we can try, okay? 
we can go in that direction. So, you know, there's a lot coming up to help us uh, steep ourselves in the great ageless wisdom, which really holds in many ways in terms of consciousness, the salvation of humanity. Now, let's see here. A little before we, it says, you must bear in mind, we're talking about various uh, stages in dealing with glamour and in encountering glamour through which the human being uh, becoming uh, the ambitious human being and then the aspirant and then the disciple may pass and probably does. So he says you have to bear in mind that uh, none of these uh, three stages are in reality divided off from each other by clear lines of demarcation, nor do they follow each other in a clear sequence. And this is um, oftentimes reflected in the development of the petals of the egoic lotus. You might think that they are sequentially developed one after another in perfect order, but it much depends on the individuality of the one who's being developed and what kind of advantage that uh, individual has taken of opportunities. Like, you know, as he tells us, sometimes a petal in the next tier can be develop, uh, de developing simultaneously with the petals of a lower tier. So everything is very uh, individual. They proceed, this development proceeds, with much overlapping and often with a partial simultaneity. So, you know, it's probably a good thing for each of us to know, or at least have some kind of conjecture, as to what petal we may be working on and how we're using our rheology and how we're using our astrology to develop the kinds of abilities and achievements that pertain to that pedal. And, uh, you know, I, I undertake this um, in the uh, Egoic Lotus video book, which you can find on Makara, and I think you can find it on YouTube also. So I focus pedal after pedal in terms of what kind of development will be undergone by the individual focusing in that area. And in general, I just might say that for people of our type, development in the seventh pedal and eighth pedal, and maybe for some, the ninth pedal um, is what's on the agenda. And meanwhile, the other pedals lesser petals come to fulfillment as the concentration is focused upon the initiatory ring of mental sacrificial petals. Okay, so anyway, um, every true disciple is facing initiation, whether it's the first, second, or third, and it's, he says it's only when the disciple faces certain initiations that he awakens to the fact of these um, distinctions in the developmental sequence. So he gives us now five stages which involve the various initiations, I think we'll see, and the kind of development we, we undergo when we're facing these initiations. Now remember the all but one of Master DK's students to whom he was writing especially had stood before the Christ and taken the first initiation. There was one who had not, he was the third race soul and uh, I think there was another third race soul too there but that, that one had at least taken the first initiation, but this one man who was often very glamoured uh, had failed to do so. But, you know, we can look at, um, at who they were, these students of DK, 
And if you read carefully, you'll see they're not so very different from, from whom we are. And uh, I think we can find that it is probable that uh, many who adhere to Master DK's teaching over a long period of time and use it, you know, much as the center of their esoteric and uh, spiritually developmental life have probably taken the first initiation or are close to doing so. And then, of course, comes the one that is so difficult. And that is, you know, when <laughs> people are taking the second initiation, they they think they're going through such stress and strain that they often estimate that they are passing through the fourth degree. But, you know, we'll develop the right sense of proportion as we go along. So let's see what he says here. In the first initiation, the disciple demonstrates that he has resolved the dualities of the physical plane and can rightly, notice there's a qualifier there, rightly impose etheric energy, the higher of the two, upon physical energy. So uh, these two types of energy are no longer separate and uh, warring. Now, there may be instances in our daily life when etheric and uh, dense physical energy are a bit uh, at war, but generally by the time the first degree is taken, involving the sacral center and its uh, transference to the throat center, and then, of course, at all the first four initiations, different activations of the heart center do occur. So there is some greater activation of the heart center. We're talking about heart and soul. Soul is connected with the heart. Yes, um, but in general, it's all about sacral and throat center, a lower form of creativity and a higher form of creativity working through the throat center. Now, for many human beings, this took place as an initiation a long time ago. It's called a Lemurian initiation. So, you know, just kind of get these distinctions in your mind, sort of like signposts along the way, uh, sort of like scaffolding that you can hang on to if you need to, you know, mental pillars so you can orient yourself correctly. Anyway, um, etheric energy is the home of many of the higher energies as they descend and as the etheric body is trained to receive them. And then, of course, they have to be imposed on the ancient fires, as they are called in the treatise on white magic. And these ancient fires, basically the energies of the moon chain and even of the previous solar system, present quite a problem, but uh, they can be overcome in their tendency and reconditioned so they are more suitable for the intended developments of the, um, the fifth or second major solar system that we are in right now. All right, now, so that's the first encounter, you know, and he's not really yet talking about the dweller. In the second initiation, the initiate demonstrates that he can choose between the pairs of opposites and proceeds with decision upon the middle way. This is, in a way, a, an astral plane initiation. It involves very much the sixth ray, as the first initiation involves the seventh. And the pairs of opposites here uh, are vertical. And they pretty much represent the soul and the personality. Now, you know, if we try to tread either way exclusively, we have a problem because treading simply the way of the uh, personality does not work when you're trying to spiritualize that personality. And attempting to tread only the way of the soul may overlook some practical issues which have to be solved. You know, we 
have the mystical consciousness. It has to do with where the energy comes. It rests above the head, and then it doesn't settle into the center of the etheric brain. So the middle way uh, prevents us from that uh, uh, very high, uh, apparently high, orientation which discounts the integration of the soul and personality. This is usually the uh, the major uh, battleground for intelligent uh, humanity, and it's called the Kurukshetra, named after that ancient battle. Maybe uh, if, if Philip Lindsay is correct about this, uh, in the hidden history of humanity, maybe some four million years ago. It's a long time, and it's difficult to say, uh, <laughs> it's difficult to say what kind of weaponry was involved there. It almost sometimes seems it was a very advanced battle from the military perspective, and you begin to wonder even about atomic weapons and things of that sort. So you just kind of ask yourself, are you no matter where you are and what point of tension you may be living at, are you treading a middle way? Taking advantage of values from below and values from above and uh, blending them in the way you are treading the path. That would be the ideal. And it does seem to reflect what is called the noble, noble middle path of the Buddha. And, uh, you know, to avoid the extremes at this point. There may come some incarnations when, uh, you know, extremes are necessary. But in general, one uh, makes haste slowly and carefully and takes many factors into consideration without pushing it too hard in the direction of the spirit is liable to create a kind of imbalance. Anyway, it's uh, emotional decisions are involved here. And which side of the, uh, is it the Pandarva or something like that? Which side of that family do you fight on? Those representing the dark or the light? That's the question. And they're both aspects of your family, internal family, that is. In the third initiation, the initiate can employ the intuition. Now, remember, following the third initiation, it really is the intuition that is uh, cultivated, and um, because that has to be in, in very full functioning order for the fourth degree. Um, and we have what's called the coordination under Neptune. He tells us, look for Neptune in the chart. The coordination under Neptune of the buddhic vehicle, sometimes following a little bit the second initiation, but for sure following the third initiation. And so we really do have the uh, development of the intuition following this initiation. So the initiate can employ the intuition and right perception of truth. The third initiation is called intuitive instinct. And in that initiation, this is interesting, he catches the first real glimpse of the dweller on the threshold and the angel of the presence. I mean, we're liable to see our negative qualities, you know, fleetingly uh, as we develop in earlier times, and we're supposed to take care of them. But now we're talking about the dweller on the threshold as a whole and this uh, angel, which is a uh, expression, I think, of the solar angel, who having pervaded uh, the entire universe of man with a fragment of itself uh, remains. So this is the, whatever you saw before this point, whatever you saw before the third initiation regarding your own negative qualities, uh, those um, those sites were simply that, not the entirety of the dweller on the threshold. And notice the word glimpse. It means it's fleeting. 
you know it's not uh, you're not there to just really be able to gaze at it and see every aspect of it and notice the word real the first uh real glimpse because there have been other fleeting impressions as you were working on the first and second degree but never the entire dweller on the threshold and what this would really mean is that most of uh, master decay's students you know they're not yet applicants to the third degree uh, that they really haven't seen their own dweller on the threshold with any kind of completeness not yet so there we have it um intuition is developing the right perception of truth Intuitive instinct is developing spiritual instinct at the first initiation and the illumined mind and spiritual intelligence at the second initiation and, as I said, intuitive instinct at the third. Now we get to the fourth initiation. It's, uh, you know, uh, we look forward to it, but realistically, uh, DK is uh, not training those who are applying to the fourth initiation at least uh, not in general although you know uh, his writings are so voluminous that not only might arhats um, derive benefit from what he says just the way they do from the light of the soul the yoga sutras the third and fourth books but even fifth degree initiates, uh, a stage that he is transcending, would be developing, um, would, would, be, would, would see material that is assisting their growth. Naturally, he's not going to point that out in, in general. He's not going to say, okay, now listen up, all you becoming masters of wisdom, because what I'm saying here concerns you particularly, although he comes pretty close sometimes to do that. In the fourth initiation, the initiate demonstrates his ability to produce complete at one moment between the higher and lower aspect of the soul in manifestation. So the lower aspect of the soul uh, in manifestation is pretty much the personality, and the higher aspect is the egoic lotus or causal body. Now, that's not the true and real soul, which we are told later uh, is the spiritual triad. The true ego, with a capital E, is the spiritual triad. Okay, but complete at one moment between the higher soul and lower soul, and sees the dweller on the threshold uh, merge into the angel of the presence. So this is the real completion of soul infusion because the angel of the presence represents soul infusion at this point uh, as we've been told 25 percent atomic matter suggesting that kind of infusion at the first degree 50 percent at the second 75 percent at the third and finally a hundred percent in the vehicles a hundred percent atomic matter uh, at the fourth initiation. So anyway, these two, the highly developed personality of the becoming fourth degree initiate, merging into the angel uh, of the presence. So um, when do you become, really, a soul-infused personality? Well, it's uh, the completeness of it is rather late in the day. We are, all of us at this point, because of our studies partially soul infused personalities um interesting what rays rule these initiations um this initiation is ruled by the fourth ray which is called the ray of at one moment so notice the completed one moment between the higher and lower aspects of the soul how does it go first initiation <sighs> seventh ray second uh second initiation sixth ray third initiation fifth ray 
fourth initiation taken very much in the heart center, among other areas, uh, it has the fourth ray. And then for mastership, we have the first ray ruling that. And also, if we study a treatise on cosmic fire, we'll see that the third ray is also active at the fifth uh, initiation. Certainly at the sixth, the third ray is active, and at the seventh, again, the second ray, and at the eighth and ninth initiations, combinations of rays are available. The eighth initiation, the combination of the four rays of attribute, and the ninth initiation, the combination of the three rays of aspect. And you know, where do, where do you get this? Where can you find this? And study it a bit more carefully than we can do right now. And I'll show you. So if you go into the book, The Rays and the Initiations, and you go here, just check it off. And I think it's, um, goodness, <laughs> I don't want to be forgetting that now, do I? Uh, I think it's around page 320, but I might be, I, I might be mistaken. Oh, three, 320, that's very interesting. Why doesn't that work? Page 320, and let's see. Okay, I think the way to do it for me then, um, no, it's 340. That's what it is. Three, four, oh, there it is. Okay, so you see the rays that rule the various initiations. Now, when you go into cosmic fire, um, you see a different series of rays, some of them identical, that rule the different initiations. And I'll look up the word aggressive fire, which should take us to um, the sixth ray, aggressive fire. And there, there it is. That, that's the tabulation you need. It's basically page 433. Uh, and notice the blending power of the third logos is felt at the fifth. And not only the third ray, as heretofore discussed uh, in the rays and initiations, for the sixth initiation, but the second Logos gets in on the act. And finally, at the seventh initiation, not just the second ray, as is being discussed on page 433 of rays and the initiation, but the first Logos. So there are some combinations of rays that are here. So take these seven if you want to know what's going on in any particular initiation in terms of the rays, and then go to the book. Yeah. Go to the book of Treatise on Cosmic Fire, go to page 433, and let's see. Oh, no, this is... Uh, Let's see if I have it. No. So this would have been it. This is it. No, no, not 433. 340. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Those are your two sources. And notice when we get into some of the higher initiations, different rays appear. Third ray for the sixth initiation, whereas Cosmic Fire just said the second. And second ray for the seventh initiation, whereas Cosmic Fire just said the first. And first ray for the fifth initiation, whereas Cosmic Fire just said the third. Up to that point, I think everything is in agreement. Well, why is it important to know these things? Um, all of us, as uh, let's let's call ourselves true disciples, are working on initiation, which is a 
what are the qualities we're developing, what are the centers to be activated, what are the rays we are utilizing, how do the astrological factors we have blend in with the rays and uh, give us the equipment we need to accomplish a step along the way of this uh, initiation. Okay, now going back. And in the fifth initiation, <laughs> well, it's, it's problematic because the causal body is destroyed already by that time, and so what's really happening here? In the fifth initiation, and here words fail to express the truth, thank goodness for that, he, the initiate, sees the dweller on the threshold, which also should have been destroyed by this time. He sees the dweller on the threshold, the angel of the presence, and the presence, which I assume to be the monad itself, merge into a divine synthesis. So what is the dweller at this point? Is it the completely soul-infused personality? Causal body is gone. Apparently the personality is gone. The spiritual triad uh, is found here, but what this really is all about, and I think what we have to remember, it is um, a big synthesis. And everything that was a personal and related to the permanent atoms of the personality get lifted up into the spiritual triad. All the content of the, um, the soul body is reapportioned in the spiritual triad. And eventually, all of this gets lifted up into the monad and I would say that occurs at the sixth initiation, the ascension. Now, you know, if you are an ascended master, you know, there's so much glamour around that particular word, uh, phrase, ascended master, but just forget most of what you're going to encounter when you start reading about that. Um, if you are an ascended master, you have your point of tension within the monadic field, but you have not forgotten everything that has gone before. You still can speak like a human being. I mean, the Christ was uh, a becoming sixth degree initiate in, in his um, Palestinian experience. He could talk to people normally and, uh, and, and the Buddha would talk to people normally after his, uh, sixth initiation you don't forget where you've been and what you've done but you have this huge monadic uh, uh, kind of uh, perspective and that's what we're working on as a matter of fact you know we have a new you probably aware of it but uh, some years ago uh, we started doing ident identify as being and we went through two segments of it. Now we're on the final and third and largest segment of Identify as Being. We've had one meeting on that already, which is a discussion of this type, and uh, very shortly uh, we'll determine when the next meeting will be. Uh, I just want to announce again that Tui and I, towards the end of the coming week, uh, may not be fully available and into the next week. So we will suspend the ASK program for a little while and we'll let you know when. Okay, so now we've had five stages dealing with the merging of the soul and personality and finally even the, the monad, the higher aspect of man's uh, being. The question, now you see, we're not going to get into this yet. This, this will come next. The question arises as to what produces this glamour and illusion. The subject is so vast, embracing as it does the whole field of planetary history. Just think of that for a moment. That I can do little more than indicate some of the causes. 
few of them, these causes, have as yet been susceptible of correction, except in the case of individuals. And naturally, DK is wise enough to give us a method of dealing with individual glamours, even as we aspire to deal with the group glamours. So all this means that when individuals reach the point in evolution where they can identify themselves with the higher aspect, the soul, and then can bring in soul energy to offset, subdue, and dominate the lower forces of the personality, then correction becomes possible and inevitably takes place. But we can see, you know, that the subject of glamour is a difficult one and it's not until later in our developmental process that we can do anything about it and when it comes to group glamours such as our sweeping through certain nations and certainly you know when world war ii swept germany with its pisces personality swept germany off its feet it's only complete disaster that can kind of break the glamorous spell and they i think they've come a long way in that respect since that time when therefore the time comes when a very large number of persons become aware of the condition of world glamour through discovering it and dealing with it in their own lives now think about that because our own individual work with ourselves and our sort of hidden imperfections and hidden uh, uh, valueless, desirous orientations, then we shall have a group approach to the problem. Maybe somewhere in a few centuries and Vulcan will be involved, he's, he's talked about. Then we shall have a definite attack upon the world glamour. And when this does take place, and I think I've got to get these things together, when this does take place, esoterically then, quote, an opening will be made which will admit the light of the solar orb. Now, there is a hint, those of you who are visualizing about the eradication of glamour, the entrance of the solar orb into the fogs and mists and density signifies the coming of truth, truth. An opening will be made which will admit the light of the solar orb. Just the way it happens, you know, in the morning you've seen the fog burn off under the influence of the rising sun. The fogs will slowly disappear, subdued by the solar radiance, and the pilgrims will then find the enlightened way, which leads from the heart of the fog, you know, the very densest glamour that we're immersed in, probably don't even realize it, straight to the door of light, straight to initiation. Okay, so that's what I'm going to deal with right now. It's um, not a lot of text, but it is um, somehow very important in describing the process that we all, yeah, that we all will pass through and we want to know where we are right now and each one of us perhaps in a different place so this is the end of 115 and the reading has been um <laughs> not really number 55 i think is that correct michael yes this is reading 55. okay thank you and it's been on the souls to stay, and uh, it's only really been one page that we've looked at, I think. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, basically, we've stuck to 103. And then we'll uh, carry on next week. I do think we'll, we will have our meeting next week. It will be an evening meeting, and it'll be number 116. And in the morning, we'll come to Science of Triangles. And it will be the 56th meeting, a uh, rather academic reading, and it will be the 28th of June, and we're still on page 103, 
and it will be a evening meeting. Well, it's quite a subject, you know. Um, the world uh, at the moment is swept by um, untruth, uh, deliberate fabrications, and maybe um, the United States with its Gemini personality, uh, Gemini being known as a sign initially that can certainly invent a lot of things. Anything ruled by Mercury, you know, Mercury is a planet which sort of plays with the truth at first. Look at Scorpio, let Maya flourish and deception rule. Maybe the United States is the worst of it all, you know, under the present leadership with its uh, untethered untethered relationship to the truth. So uh, without the truth, we can't be set free. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and without the truth, um, we will not make progress to true spiritual realization. And so many things uh, prevent the registration of the truth. And a lot of it is uh, egoism or egotism, a lot of uh, self-concern, self-focus, you know, it's a distortion. The soul brings truth, but as long as we're fixated upon our lower identity, we don't care much about the life of the soul. Now, all of this will be corrected largely in the fifth petal of the Egoic Lotus process where you, well, uh, you may enter as an egotist, but you leave as an aspirant, and there's a lot of uh, suffering that goes on. The development of these petals takes place over many thousands of years, and in some case, cases, it takes place over millions of years. So that will be as far as we'll go today. And just remember, you are passing through one of these areas, you know, probably not so much the first, but maybe a combination of the second and preparing the third, not the fourth. No, I don't think so. And not the fifth. No, a different type of teaching would be available to you and to all of us if we were passing through the fourth and the fifth stages. But a lot of the second stage work on the battlefield of Kurukshetra is going on, even for disciples who feel that long ago they've somehow overcome all that and dismissed all that. Still, it goes on. And when it comes to the cultivation of the intuition at the third degree, well, we're trying, okay? We're trying to get that going and to perceive truth directly, straight knowledge as it's called, by thinking the truth and uh, speaking the truth whenever we have the opportunity. And then the merging, uh, a major movement towards real soul infusion should be occurring uh, for some of us and uh, eventually for all of us. Soul infusion is the key and so every day there has to be that um, attention given to it and and to really bring that higher energy as in the meditation, that higher light of the soul into uh, our consciousness. Okay, friends, so now uh, your turn and your thoughts, okay. Kim has posted two questions. Okay, uh, yeah, 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 uh, okay. Kim, um, yes, uh -huh, right. I heard or read recently something about we have to link with eight hearts, eight heart centers of other people to become a disciple. Not sure that I'm remembering that correctly. Uh, it's uh, to become absorbed into the planetary logos. Uh, the, there are these groups of nine centers and it's uh, pretty much to become a true server uh, maybe it doesn't mean you know there are disciples of all kinds some of whom have not linked in this way 
with the heart centers of eight other people. But if we want to be absorbed into the planetary logos, um, then that is, let's see, I'm not sure I can find that one easily. Absorbed logos heart. Let's see if we can do anything there. Uh huh. Okay, well, we found it right off the bat. It's in astrology. And let's see what it Ah, what it says here, uh, the view should be, um, <laughs> yeah, 197, a vesoteric, uh, or is it, no, it's the, uh, is the uh, esoteric psychology book number two. Um, new, become a functioning member. Certain develops, developments must have taken place in the individual before he can consciously become a functioning member of the new group of world servers, which is the principal group at this time, definitely working under the law of group progress, the fifth law of the soul. I just want to confirm that the law of sacrifice is the fundamental and first law of the soul, then magnetic impulse for the second and the law of service for the third and uh, the law of repulse for the fourth and the law of group progress for the fifth law after that um it becomes quite a cult and uh, we're not uh, in the position very much to do uh to fulfill those other laws it's something like magnetic expansion something like that and the law of the lower four okay so if we want to really work at this time with the new group of world servers and under the law of group progress which interestingly is a capricorn law because uh, it's also called the law of elevation and we know the capricorn climbs to the top of its particular mountain. He must have the heart center awakened and be so outgoing in his, quote, behavior that the heart is rapidly linked up with the heart centers of at least eight other people. Now, remember at this point that when DK drew these people together, he organized them into groups of nine. So it seems that very much he was following uh, this particular arrangement. Groups of nine awakened aspirants can be occultly absorbed into the heart center of the planetary logos. Now, what is that heart center? From one perspective, we might call it the spiritual hierarchy of the planet. That's one way of looking at it from another perspective, it is one or other of the planetary uh, chains within a scheme. So, you know, what am I saying here? Uh, try to get this. Yeah, well, you know, within the solar god, one of these planetary schemes is considered a heart center. And, uh, but we, we're not talking about that so much. We're talking about within the Earth scheme, there is also a heart center. And that involves the chain idea. Now, the base of the spine, where we are, is the Earth chain and the Earth globe. And maybe, who knows, maybe Venus, maybe the Venus um, chain couldn't be considered like a heart center of our particular planetary logos. So, linking up and absorbed in the heart center of the planetary logos. Through it, his life can flow, and the group members can contribute their quota of energy to the life influences circulating through his causal body. Now, that's going to be the causal body of the planetary logos. 
the above piece of information is of interest to those who are spiritually awakened and will mean little or nothing to those who are asleep. Okay. And here are some other uh, requirements that are needed if we are to become conscious functioning members of the new group of world servers. The head center must also be in process of awakening and the ability to, quote, hold the mind steady in the light, close quote, must be somewhat developed. And then the next one, some forms of creative activity must likewise be found and the server must be active along some humanitarian, artistic, literary, philosophic, or scientific line. So I think we see how important it is that uh, there is a revival of these groups of nine. And we talked maybe a little bit in the last few times about how they may function. And, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a group of nine that exists right in your neighborhood. Maybe it used to have to be, and, you know, you would meet in New York and something like that. But now these groups of nine can function all over the world because we have the kind of mass intercommunication system under Mercury, which allows that to happen. Okay, so that's maybe examining the first question and let's see what else can you explain the dweller <laughs> yeah can you explain the dweller on the threshold well you know the ancient um, idea there is that the collection of all our unredeemed impulses gathered together in one ghastly sight stand at the threshold of initiation and make it very difficult because he has not overcome them for the would-be initiate to pass into the clear light of day. The kind of definition that DK seems to emphasize the most has to do with uh, uh, the polished personality. The personality that is very well equipped, uh, very trained, uh, very efficient, very successful, so much so that it may want to live life on its own terms, quite different from what the soul would have it do. It's supposed to sacrificially lay all it has become at the feet of the soul and to be directed but maybe it's quite pleased with itself and goes off in its own direction, still with much to redeem and still with much humility to be accomplished. Now, on a higher turn of the spiral, we remember the story of the rich young man who had pretty well filled his causal body with all kinds of virtues, but he wasn't willing to sacrifice it to the divine plan and be led entirely by the Christ. You know, sell all you own, give the proceeds to the poor, and follow me. He wasn't willing to do that, so he went sadly away. So there's a lot on this question of what is the dweller on the threshold. Just to begin with, even though until the third degree we may not see the entirety of the dweller, we can at least see some of our own negative traits, and we all have them. And we can begin to address ourselves to the correction of those negativities. And that will lead us to the point where we can actually begin to see what the dweller on the threshold looks like. Not a pleasant sight. <laughs> Not a pleasant sight, very shocking to many of us. Oh, you mean I'm really like that? But I thought I overcame those things a long time ago. How can I be like that? But, you know, you have to be rather brave when you're a disciple, and you have to be willing to face the truth about yourself. So many people fail 
as they just can't face the very unpleasant truth about themselves and uh, deal directly with it. They're always blaming, blaming it on the other guy. And, you know, that is called, especially when it's unconscious, is called projection. Um, projection. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, so there, there you go. If what I'm uh, experiencing now is only a glimpse, I hate to imagine <laughs> what what uh, the rest of it could be. Well, you know, I tell you what, I I had that experience too. I I thought of myself, you know, as quite an aspirant, uh, really intense and really determined to achieve things in esotericism and maybe, you know, filled with ambition, who knows, spiritual ambition, all the rest. Then I went to the arcane school and I had a job there managing secretaries, you know, the mentors and all that kind of thing. <laughs> that I'd get in the meditation room. Well, it even happened before that, you know, I, I went to the Masonic Lodge and did a lot of work there and stuff would come up. I couldn't imagine where it was coming from. Obviously, the lower part of the aura needed cleansing. <laughs> and, you know, it was just a shock at the kind of things that were coming up. Now, gradually, you know, I wrestled all that down and expelled it and used the 15 councils in a treatise on white magic, you know, cast out all fear all hate, all greed. We're supposed to look out and up towards the soul. So there's going to be a wrestling match on the ladder of evolution, and Jacob is going to wrestle with the angel. And the result is going to be some unpleasant visions of things you thought you had long ago conquered, but there they are under Pluto staring you in the face. And remember, before you can really go through initiation or recapitulate or whatever, Pluto is going to do its work. It's going to be the, the dredge that takes things from the bottom <laughs> and shows them to you. But, well, we've got to all clean up our act. This is what DK calls house cleaning. He directs it to the political area. He directs it to the church area. <laughs> but frankly, you know, we've got a lot to do right in the individual area. So, okay. So I think that, you know, gives us an orientation. And thanks for that, uh, you know, that good question. We really need to, we're not going to know the entirety of the dweller for a while. But we're going to get an ever more intense view of it, and we're going to figure out how to handle it. Okay, thanks, Ken. Okay, Michael, is there anybody else that seems to want to say anything, or any member of the staff that would like to say anything about all these that we've been reading? I see no hands raised or other questions posed. Okay. Well, DK has enriched us so tremendously. I'm thinking I've been reading Master DK now for 47 years. I traveled to the uh, Olcott uh, in Wheaton, Illinois, I think it is, you know, and, uh, back in 1971, and <laughs> it was humorous. I, You know how theosophy has this peculiar love-hate relationship with what whatever Alice Bailey did. And there were the Bailey books so high on the shelf that I could barely reach them. But I was determined and persistent, and I think I took uh, the psychology books home with me and um, maybe a couple of others, maybe four books altogether. And, you know, that got me really launched, 1971. So 48, 47 years ago. And it's just a drop in the bucket, you know. We think that by that time we should really know something. Well, we know something, but not 
yet what can be extracted from the magnificent, enriching teaching given by Master D.K. So I'm sure the, the farther we go, we all stand in appreciation of his great gift to us and to humanity in general, and he just keeps on pouring it out. Three series of bridging treatises between the science and wisdom of humanity as it is and the real science and wisdom of the initiates. That's what we want to assimilate and apply. Okay. All right. Uh, any final things before we get into our meditation? You know, we, we've been hovering around the personality, these glamours of personality that distort so much our sight of the truth and uh, enlarge the lower ego to the point where it really obstructs the light. This is one of the major things. All of these glamours surrounding mistaken identity, at least at this point, through identification, eventual identification, and right contemplation, um, we begin to merge with reality, and no longer are these um, lesser issues in our way. Okay, Alex. Yes, Alex, go ahead. Hello, nice to see you again. Um, so watching the news and um, listening to how deeply we are now swamped in glamour um, and the, what little sense comes out of our our, our leaders and the people enabling and supporting them. It just occurred to me, um, I'm wondering if we should be focusing on, I mean, I know we have the 12 seed groups, and, but I just wondered if we should be focusing on creating, really focusing on creating leaders for the future or, you know, um, amongst us, um, amongst our children, uh, it just, everyone is waiting for the right person to come along, to sort this all out, to speak the truth, mm. to put us in the right direction. Mm. And we're meditating on it and we're praying for it. Mm. But I'm just wondering if we could do more to well, actually create those. Well, you know, I think um, in this case, Olivia is the person to talk to because Somehow she is a, um, a yeah, me member right. of some groups that are actually attempting, at least in the United States, to cultivate uh, such leaders. So, you know, and, and of course, you know, in our work with Mor right. Moria Federation and the Arcane School and all these esoteric schools, you're supposed to uh, emerge with some sense of what is your service. So as as these schools really begin to kick in, you know, uh, there'll be more and more people coming out in the political, social field. I know it seems like, how can we wait that long? But, uh, uh, you know, the next hundred years, uh, Alexander, are not, uh, I think they're going to be quite tur turbulent. The masters, the masters are coming out, and their approach will bring about uh, turbulence. So we have a hundred years in which to kind of do the things you're talking about. Now, I agree. Uh, there can be schools specifically for the cultivation of this kind of uh, political, social approach. And, you know, we, we've been given a esoteric methods, at least, of clearing the decks. So groups like ours are a bit like the crab that cleans the ocean of matter that flows around the souls of men. Remember that that phrase, he says, that the crab is cleaning all that away, and we've been given the method of doing it. Now, if somebody feels really called and is capable of 
organizing people for a new type of leadership in different countries. I think that's great, and it's happening in some places. But I think Olivia is the one to talk to particularly about that. She knows the most of anyone that I know about that because I think she's a member of it, you know, somehow. Yes, because because otherwise it struck me I might have to throw my hat in the ring myself in my next embodiment. And I don't really want my hand to be forced in that direction. So but but I'd know, much rather help. Uh, <laughs> you know what happens? Help uh, so we say, create hey, leaders. I'm going to do that in my next life, you say, you know. And the next time you find yourself, yeah. it's, it's this life and you're doing it. You know, I, mean, I, I had an experience like that long ago. I was really interested in the seven rays, interested. And I said, well, in the next life, we'll really get into the seven rays. Okay. And the next thing I knew, it was this life, and I was really getting into it. So sometimes these ideas about someone else in the next life end up being yeah. me in this life. <laughs> so, uh, it's hey. It's too late in this life. <laughs> oh, well, okay, let's just see. Let's just see. We'll, we'll find you running for office. Um, well, you know, we can we can all string a sentence together. Yes. A lot better than a lot of these people I've been listening to. Not to mention, you know, think things through, and um, yeah, yeah. you know, it, it's just it's just remarkable. Why should we be sitting here watching this? Well, you we, know? Should, <laughs> you know, in in terms of our esoteric methods, we are we are given a way of being very active. Now, whether our outer circumstances yeah. allow yeah. us to really enter, you know, I'm not sure you want to run against Boris Johnson at this moment. Maybe a little more preparation. Oh, I do. Will be needed. <laughs> I do. I, I, I do. It's like in, in Marianne Williamson yes. was asked in America. She was asked, um, "How would you deal with Trump in in an, in a debate?" And she said, "Well, how would you deal with a child?" And that's exactly. <clears throat> yep. Excuse yeah, me, yeah. my voice is going. That's yeah. exact. That's exactly it. You yeah. know, we could. It's so it's so easy for a reasonable person to speak to these people. Well, until you know, the heat of the moment gets pretty intense. But look, we're dealing with, in the case of many leaders, psychologically unsound people who have arrested development. That's you know I want to use the psychological term arrested yes. development. Something yes. just stopped them, and they're forcing their own very inadequate psychology. Uh, on all the others. Uh, Philip Roth, you know, he novelist, he just recently passed away, and he, he said uh, of, the, of the man, he said, uh, the evil sum of his deficiencies. And I thought, oh, boy, that rang in my ears. And, uh, you know, uh, it's not exactly the philosopher king, is it? Or queen, for that matter, whatever happens to be. Plato's view that you can't even, you know, you're really going to be cultivated properly to lead your society. And you can just imagine what a philosopher, a king or queen has that our modern politicians absorbed by their intense selfishness and lower desires are the victim of, see? So we've got a lot of work yeah. to do. We just work where we can work, you know. We'll, Yes, I think education is really the key, isn't it? Now, it's education and growing these leaders. We really have to focus on that. Yeah. Yeah. I keep on, you know, I, you know, Lincoln was a, a racial avatar, and von, von Bismarck was his uh, opposite, you know. And I keep on waiting for the next incarnation of Abraham Lincoln. I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I visualize him or whatever he is becoming, and the great indigo light, because, you know, no question that such a man as that is a second-ray monad, you know, second-ray personality, second-ray monad, first-ray soul. And I keep on uh, with great hope, uh, because, uh, you know, obviously his work for humanity is not done, just the way the work of Bach for the great harmonious music is not yet done, awaiting the Renaissance, you know, that's coming. So I, uh, I maybe it's fanciful, but I certainly visualize him and uh, let's say others are leaving the White House as the spirit of truth, mercy, and compassion uh, fill, fills it 
and other countries, such as, you know, with the secondary soul, you, you realize that um, of the countries that he gave with their mottos in the destiny of the nations, only two of them have secondary souls. Only one has a seventh race soul. None have a third race soul. And so he distributes them. Just look at that page on the motto on the mottos of the nations. Matter of fact, I think I'll do that just for fun. Because it's so uh let's see, let's see. The destiny. And um and what does he say? If I say I light the way. So uh here there it is. This is a, this is a place where when you look at that, you really see what the nations are supposed to contribute. Two with second ray souls, the great indigo light, China loves red, maybe India does too. Uh I I don't see uh I don't see India here, but the, the, the China has the first ray of power. And so does India. I hide the light. Somewhere that should be. Ah, there it is. I just needed one more click. So you see, that's pretty much the contribution on the world stage right now. And so interesting that when it comes to the rays of Aquarius, which involve the seventh ray from one perspective and definitely the fifth ray from another, there's only one seventh ray soul contributor and one fifth ray soul contributor and a couple of fourth rays a couple of six rays and uh, i think that's yeah that's it this is a very good page in terms of what we can teach our nations to give to the world when we teach ourselves to work on what i call our ray of contribution not so much our ray of acquisition, but our ray of contribution. We're, we're acquiring many things, but they're not ready to be used. But here, there is a readiness to use them. Okay. All righty. Can I just say one more thing? Yeah. Can I just say one more thing? Just let the word go forth, that people understand that only one in every 400 persons in this country is now going to be responsible for electing the next prime minister. It is not the people of Britain. It is 120,000 staunch right-wing Tory conservative members yeah. who are going to elect the next prime minister. And the prime minister has been, and this front runner has been said to be the most dishonest person that could possibly be elected who does not is incapable of caring for anyone other than himself. Oh, well. And how we have to think, how is it? How, how does this happen? How can this, how can this happen? And in my vision, I see these dark and light forces and a tremendous clash. And somehow everyone's been put to sleep. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, yeah. and, and, and and the most improbable, unlikely, and undesirable yes, thing. It's amazing. It's about to occur. Remember, <laughs> remember that big, big fight in Atlantis, how it was that the, <laughs> the lords of the shining countenance at last began to prevail. What happened there was they sent a magnetic uh, sleep upon the... Uh, the dark giants, you might say, and they fell into it. And when they woke up, the waters had risen too far, you know. Yeah, that's so, it. That's so, what so, just so. happened. So here we are. But look, you know, eventually it all it all Thank comes you. around. It all comes around. Thank you, Alex. We always, I think you're Capricorn, aren't you? I mean, Aquarius Capricorn, I think you are. We'll get yes, the I am. political sure. view from you. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. Okay, anything else, friends? Anything else? <sighs> I mean, you know, let's just keep absorbing what Master DK has given and find ways to apply it. it uh, that's our job, and we all know the story 
that if there had been enough consecrated disciples in the 1930s, the war at the end of the 30s would not have precipitated. So we know the story. And we also know, I think, in that respect, what is the demand upon us. We certainly have the wherewithal to learn as a disciple of the Great White Lodge and to apply in our own environment. And our environment now is very wide with the Internet. We can really make a big application. So let's let's do that. Let's... Uh, do that. And Kim has added another comment. At some point, I'd like to understand more about cosmic evil, although at the same time, I don't really want or am afraid to. Well, you know, he says, don't speculate too much about it. He's given us a lot. Um, and he says there are basically six leaders in that group in the east and six in the west and the uh the ones in the east are older and better trained and more dangerous you know that the uh, nazis were always uh, sending um, expeditionary forces to tibet to meet the people that could teach them certain things that would help them overcome their enemies so these six are uh, op uh, or 12 are operative in the world today now, if you, you know, if you collect what's there, there's a lot that he has given. But he also says, um, we aren't to focus on it very much. He says, uh, speculation, speculation anent which uh, is both uh, fruitless and dangerous, fruitless and dangerous. Now, you have to what do they say? Uh, keep your friends close to you and your enemies even closer. We have to know something. We have to know something about their methods as they war militantly against the aspirant. It tells us in uh, a treatise on white magic, there's a militant warring against the best efforts of the aspirant. And so we have to at least know what to look for because these are subtle days and the very ugly uh, presentation of evil can be hiding behind the apparent presentation of truth. So I know that we probably have a, a compilation on this. Uh, you know, uh, Zach uh, Rymill from Australia and New Zealand was a he has been a wonderful compilationist, and he took some of the big, big subjects and made uh, compilations on them. Like, you know, for instance, there's a huge compilation on Shambhala, which we really ought to go through. It's uh, got 730 or 40 or 50 entries in it. So DK says, yeah, do study topically. Because when you put all the information on the same subject together, you're going to get a lot out of it. So that's a kind of a vertical way of studying. And then there's the horizontal way of reading through the books, and all are necessary. But we have to be very judicious when we are dealing with the Black Lodge, because we may not have eliminated from our own psyche all the seeds of evil. And, you know, they can be magnetic seeds, which can attract those who are much more powerful than we are and can influence us, unfortunately. So let's take a look. You know, you can write to K, um, let's see, K. Hannon, who does so many things, uh, but she supervises the, um, this is it here. So it's k at uh, k dot aquarius at gmail dot com. So write to k, and she can get you oriented and tell you whether there is a compilation 
on cosmic evil, planetary evil, whatever, you know. And I think you'll find what you need, but read with uh, caution and not with fear. Uh, go into um, a treatise on, this, on uh, white magic and see the three different methods of banishing fear. The last one of which involves the attacks from those forces of materialism and the use of the violet light. So, you know, it, it's there, and um, I, I, I trust by this time that just most everybody here has got their Alice Bailey CD-ROM. You really, really need it. It's making things go, you know, hundreds of times faster than we could in the old days. So this is, uh, you know, Treatise on White Magic, Violet, and Violently. Violet, Violently. Okay, so here it is, um, right around page 3, 47, 46, 45, you will find what you need. Um, so you're creating a linking chain through all the vehicles, a stream of violet light. And this is when you really sense there is an occult attack. But remember, about occult attacks, it gets pretty glamorous. Some people are going around all the time saying, oh, look, I'm being attacked occultly. And all they're doing is really viewing their own unredeemed stuff. Okay, so you don't want to fall into that glamour. So this is the third method, and the other two, I think, involve white light. This method is only for use when the need is dire and the necessity great. The reason for caution lies in the etheric vehicle, which responds most violently to the color violet. So here's what you need, then, from uh, the various books, especially Treatise on White Magic, third class of fears and I think all of these different methods are found here you know around these pages <coughs> 345 44 right in here right in here and you can read through it and DK being very practical gives you the methods, whether it's a pure stream of white light pouring through your vehicles, whether it's alignment with the master and with your soul, whether it's alignment with the entire spiritual hierarchy, even. And here's a little meditation as to what you can do. And then comes what I've been talking about just now, the third class of fears where there really is an attack. So just, uh, you know, uh, here, here's an interesting thing, Kim. Uh, Master uh, Moria said, look, obsession is an epidemic, which means that the darker levels of the astral plane are taking people over these days. He says they can't do that when you have your heart center really open. So the best protection against obsession, and it's more thorough form of invasion, which we could call um, possession, is to really work with the open heart center rather than just the inquiring curious mind. Okay, so now you have a little something to arm you if you want to get into those studies. We just don't want to exaggerate anything out of proportion. That's the nature of glamour. Exaggeration minimization where where it's not appropriate okay well i think we're there for the moment let us um and remember i'm just i'm just plugging this point that at 235 gmt today uh, using our usual YouTube um, link, the live link that by now you're familiar with because every broadcast we ever do 
if it's a broadcast and not a webinar, is on that particular link. Uh, Tuya will be uh, giving the solstice uh, service uh, meditation, and we'll be linking up with that international group planning for the new group of world servers festival week from the 21st of December to the 28th of December. But we have to plan now, okay? Now let's get on with it. And this is the formula. And we're, what we're going to do is uh, we'll work on the glamour of uh, personality centralization. Some of these things are kind of Ray One glamours. Um, and uh, you know where to find this. I mean, you don't have to wait till we get there. It's going to take a little while for us to get there. But let's just say, go to the book, Glamour World Problem. Then go to page 122. No, wait, it didn't, it didn't uh, work. Now it's going to work. Okay. And there, you know, here are these various... Uh, 121, 120. And you'll see that we're dealing with a lot of um, Ray 1 approaches which are not sound because they are devoid of the group consciousness. The glamour of personal magnetism, you know, I can handle anything, uh, I'm that great. The glamour of self-centeredness and personal potency. We see that all the time. The glamour of the one at the center. <coughs> Selfish personal ambition. Being the uh, messiah in the field of politics. Uh, and I'm the alone at the center and the best of all. And you have to listen to me, you know. The glamour of superimposed will upon others and upon groups. Now, from time to time, just study this these pages uh, that list the glamours that are individual. And uh, there's the methods that, sh that we can use, similar to the group method. That beam of light to dissipate those glamours. Okay, here we go. So this is the glamour we're going to work on today, personality centralization. I think so many glamours arise out of that particular problem. And like I say, it is mistaken identity and it is the great heresy of separateness. That is the... That is the one great heresy, and that is the problem. All right. So let's just go into the silence for a little while. Some 30 of us may be here. And bring everybody in. We gather our forces. Until we become, you know, consciously one working group. Now it is uh, serious work and uh, we're working on the greatest of all the planes of illusion, looking at the term illusion in the generic sense. So. Uh, We'll use the protective formula and the long cross involving the eyes. And as we describe the cross, we'll see it tracing 
light, a lighted cross appears before the individual and before the group as a whole. As a soul, I work in light, and darkness cannot touch me. I take my stand within the light. I take my stand within the group, within the light. I work and from that point I never move. Trace the light in the cross and realize, affirm that it is protection for you individually and for the group. It's a lot easier to be overcome by glamour than we think. Now, we focus the triple light of matter vitality, raising it up to the mental plane to support our beacon of light. And there also we find on the plane of mind the light of reasoning, of logic, of rationality, clear understanding. We blend together these two lights, the vitalized energy of matter, the light of matter, everything is light. In the Kabbalah, everything is light. The universe is light. <coughs> so we raise the light, blend it with this light of the right use of the concrete mind, and then reach in a way upward to recognize for a moment soul light. And we bring this soul light down again onto the lower mental plane and blend it with the two lesser lights. So now there's a kind of soul infusion of the two original forms of light. We have a triple light. And we're going to turn on that, uh, that light, which is a searchlight. Probably all this is occurring, let us say, on the fourth level of the mental plane. Personality focus is there. It's the mental unit, and that's where we're working from, if we can, the very highest levels of the lower mental plane. So let us say the words that will bring us into the idea of the light of day, which is ruled by Scorpio, and takes us eventually to the buddhic plane. We have a triple light. We can turn it on to the astral plane, where it detects glamour and dissipates glamour. The light is one. And in that light shall we see light. This is the light that turns the darkness into day. Oh. 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 
so our beam is out on the astral plane. In that subtle world, it can detect the darkness, the veils, the fogs, the miasmas, and it can penetrate them. And it can break them up, dissipate them, take apart the coherent energy which sustained undesirable states such as glamour. And we're going to say together the formula. As we do this and use, utilize the great searchlight out on the astral plane, which we visualize as we say the formula. Radiance are we and power. We stand forever with our hands stretched out. linking the heavens and the earth. The inner world of meaning and the subtle world of glamour. Notice the difference, inner and subtle. We reach into the light and bring it down to meet the need. We reach into the silent place and bring from thence the gift of understanding. Thus with the light we work and turn the darkness into day. We'll give everything we have to this beam, this uh, perceptual mechanism, this uh, weapon. And we invoke the spiritual will to strengthen the beam. Our beam is strengthened with spiritual will coming from within our energy system and finally from the atmic plane and even from the monad if we can with power upon his beam the light is focused on the goal and so we're going to detect this glamour of unwarranted personality centralization living at too low a point of tension if our point of tension is too low then we will become victims of glamour think for a moment of everything that personality centralization is doing in our world at the present time the these low points of tension think of that and <clears throat> of the history of it of what it has given us of undesirable results let's just think of that first The influence of Mars has been very strong on Earth for a long time, and Mars, you know, is the planet of selfishness in its early development, and it's a less sacred planet than the Earth presently, and it's this Martian vibration which has to be overcome, and the Venus vibration higher than that of the Earth, which has to be substituted instead so 
We want selflessness and soul centralization, not personality centralization. And our point of attention as much as possible has to be elevated into the higher mental plane and not just um, focused only on the lower where Mars prevails, ruling the lower mind, ruling the astral body, ruling the physical body, and ruling the entire personality. We want to change the centralization of our point of attention. And so, we use this word of power. And visualize the dissipation of the detected glamours as the word of power is used. The power of our united light prevents the appearance of the glamour of personality centralization at a low point of attention. The power of our united light negates the quality of this glamour of personality centralization from affecting humanity. power of our united light destroys the life, the vitality behind this glamour of low personality centralization. And just imagine what it could be like for human beings to focus at ever higher points of tension converging upon the soul point of tension. So now, five minutes, visualizing the light penetrating the glamour, producing its weakening and dissipation, silence, intensity of purpose, and the work is seen to be proceeding.
So sometimes our image can be that sun, you know. As DK was saying earlier, the sun comes out, is rising, and is dissipating the fogs. And it's the symbol of all the desirable states we want of truth and love and will, sacrificial will. The sun comes out and dissipates the fogs, and we're able to see reality and the constraints that are placed upon us by this ancient personality centralization give way to centralization within the soul. Nous essayons actuellement de résoudre un problème avec votre connexion audio. Veuillez patienter. Your audio connection is back up and ready to go. Please allow time for your callers to rejoin. We have the French language coming in there. Uh, not sure where it came from. But you get the idea. The sun shines. And reality is revealed. In this case, the sun represents centralization of our point of tension within the soul. Three times the Om now. Three times the Om. Om. to ourselves that something of value has been done and there has been as a result of our labors even a little clearing on the astral plane and also improvement on the lower mental and the etheric physical planes Okay, friends, I thank you for uh, being here uh, with us. Um, as I say, uh, Tuya has the broadcast coming up at 2.35 p.m. Uh, GMT. And uh, here in Finland, it will be 5.35. And you just, you know, measure against GMT. It's stable universal time. If you'd like to join us, uh, we'll be celebrating the Cancer Solstice. The days are now getting shorter, and the higher interlude has been reached, and now we go into the work of embodying that which has been touched. So, under impression, we are now undertaking the work of manifesting that which has been touched. Use your normal uh, YouTube link, and we'll see you there. Uh, and we'll be joining the part of the world group that is preparing for the festival week of the new group of world service. Okay, we'll get this to you as soon as possible. Let your friends know about our programs. They can listen to them later. Some benefit from reading through the... Uh, Glamour, a world problem book, will come to them, and some benefit from our discussion and from meditation. All the best to you, and uh, thank you, thank you for being here.